Well, thank you for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and, and um, having the opportunity to hear about the Chrome project this morning has already made me start thinking slightly differently about what I'm going to say. Um, so hopefully um, I, can, I can pull it together in a way that kind of um, that makes sense. But I, I, it's really interesting um, to come and talk to another big project which is based squarely in memory studies, that takes memory studies as a kind of a, a field of inquiry that's got kind of boundaries and inclusions and, and, and a character of its own. Because I think over the last 20 years, we've seen memory studies kind of emerge really from, from being a small kind of research niche at the intersection of social sciences and humanities subjects. Um, to kind of a rich and a broad <coughs> subfield, which has got its own journal, it's got multiple professional associations, um, and it includes kind of contributions from fields as, as well as media and communications, which, which is where I come, kind of come from, through to sort of history and, and, um, and others. So in many ways, I think the field has moved very quickly. Um, it's engaged with the implications of rapidly shifting communications technologies, for example, um, with the character and quality of contemporary engagements with the past and the role of uh, memory in post-colonial societies that we've been hearing about um, this morning, um, and how those uh, memories have been mobilised in, in troubled political times, which I think from conversations from all of us from the European context feel that we're in right now, um, not least me. <laughs> Um, in the midst of Brexit. Um, <laughs> so, and memory is obviously very important to that as well. But I think what I wanted to talk about today was some of, to, to go back to what I think are some of the most important challenges that the memory studies as a field is facing um, and has faced, going right back to kind of some of the founding um, texts of memory studies, Holbach's work on collective memory, for example. Um, I think some of those challenges actually remain very much alive in the work that we're doing today, and they're still troublesome in contemporary memory studies research. So in this talk, I wanted to address two, well, three actually, interconnected challenges using examples from kind of from my own research, um, and think through the ways that we might address them um, in our work. And those are the issues of the transmission of memory over time, over space, and over social scales. Now, clearly I was completely over-ambitious in what I was going to be able to cover in half an hour, so I'm not going to do all of that. I'm going to take one of these issues, and I'm going to focus in on it more specifically. Uh, and I want to take the second issue of the, the, the movement of memory across space, and I'll, I'll try and think about the ways in which the temporal and the social are kind of implicated in that at the same time. Um, and this is partly because it's something I'm struggling with myself at the moment, um, starting a kind of a, a big project looking at post-colonial memory in relation to um, the relationship between uh, Britain and South Asia, um, particularly focusing on the 1947 partition of India. Um, but I think it's also one of the challenges um, that recent conceptual developments in memory studies have tried to deal with. Um, so I'm going to try and locate it in that sense. I think mobility and movement are becoming increasingly central to the way we think about contemporary understandings of memory and remembering practices. Concepts like transnational memory, transcultural memory, multidirectional memory, these are all things that should, you know, are probably very familiar to people in this room. Uh, and they've been used to explain the ways in which memories are embedded in cultural forms and the ways in which they move over time and space and how they shape um, contemporary social and personal identities. But we've still got a relatively limited understanding, I would say, of A, what happens to memory when it moves across space, and B, how to understand these spatial movements as always also temporal in character. So how do we understand, how do we grasp together the, the issue of mobility in time and space? Um, so in trying to address the movement of memory across space without overlooking the fact that this always occurs in and through time, I'm going to suggest that we could think perhaps in terms of mnemonic trajectories. And that the idea of trajectory or the, the, kind of the framework of trajectory can be quite useful to address the ways in which memories move, um, particularly under the conditions of late modernity, which are so marked by these social and political dynamics and cultural dyna dynamics of mobility, but also immobility and embeddedness as well. I had a slide on that. <laughs> okay, so why why space, why place? Well, I'm going to use the term place to start with. 
I think we're very familiar with talking about the movement of memory in. Oh, should just stop and stop talking. Um, we're very familiar with talking about the movement of memory in <coughs> scalar terms. We use the categories of the individual, the collective, the social, the cultural all the time. Um, and this kind of implies a continual movement of memory through time as it's communicated over these domains of social life. I think one of the difficulties that we've kind of come to when we start to talk about memory in scalar social terms is that we have this kind of tendency, and I've certainly found this in my own work, so this is not an accusation that the rest of the field, this is something that I've struggled with. Um, you know, I've certainly felt a tendency to fix the socio-spatial context in which these temporal changes and, and scalar dynamics are operating, that we see as a kind of stage just on which these kind of uh, movements are performed. So I certainly lean towards thinking about the geographical ecologies of memory as part of a stable architecture within which memories are performed. But this doesn't really work. Mobility in space is a key characteristic of late modern experience, and it's something that I certainly felt the need to address. So for me, this begs a particular mnemonic question, which is how do we make sense of our spatial mobility and the mobility of others over time in the stories of our lives? Um, and this is something that's spanning kind of my concern with the post-colonial context that I'm currently working in, but also more, more broadly than that. <clears throat> so space and place are the stuff of memory. We remember our childhood homes, where we were when 9-11 happened, the site of our first kiss. Places are hugely important. They make up the raw material of memory. But at the same time, they provide topographical arrangements for remembering practices and processes in the present. They provide this kind of architecture. They shape how we remember, as well as what we remember. So they're both structure and content, if you like, place and space. So as Joe Garder Hansen and Owen Jones have pointed out, they've done some brilliant work on, on, on media, memory, and geography. Um, mm -hmm. That places are bound up with the temporalities of lived experience, memories of who we are now, who we were, who we wanted to be, are always wrapped up in those memories of where we are, um, where we were, and where we will or would like to be. You know, those, those, those two things come together. So remembering as a lived process is always at once both a spatially situated practice in the present, structured by the places and space in the spaces in which it's enacted, <coughs> And it's also an important process of placing and locating people, so that, that active, um, active mode as well, both geographically and socially, and along with placing us in relation to them. So the existential question, with whom do we belong, is always accompanied by another question, which is, where do we belong? And those things are never, never separable from one another. Processes of remembering are always in some way performed in response to these questions. But my concern here isn't just about place, it's about movement and mobility between places. Um, and, and the ways in which we move between places are social, temporal and, 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 and cultural configurations. So I want to address the ways in which these forms of mobility are negotiated in remembering processes. So how is remembering implicated in managing and negotiating spatial mobility? How do we remember spatial transitions of various kinds? So I'm going to talk a little bit about a Leave Human project which um, I, I worked on with uh, Mike Pickering where we looked at everyday media as vehicles for memory and we worked specifically with South Asian communities in the UK um, doing that work and, and there's some work to come out of that on, on memory and management of change. And then I'm um, sort of just starting a five year project uh, funded by the Movie Human Trust on memories of partition um, in the South Asian diaspora in the UK. So I'm going to draw a bit on that as well. Um, so hopefully what you get is a sense that these are concerns that span, span those projects. They're not restricted to one case. Okay. So mobility. So mobility and movement have become an increasingly central theme in memory studies. And this has involved an increasingly prevalent tendency to see mobility across time and space as an intrinsic feature of social and cultural memory itself. Memories are themselves mobile in space. Um, Astrid Alves did a wonderful collection in Parallax in, in 2011, I think it was, um, which looked at transcultural memory in, in particular, where 
she says that all mem all cultural memory must travel. It must be kept in motion in order to stay alive and have an impact both on individual minds and social formations. And so this mobility is a communicative one. It's about communicating um, um, one past um, in, 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 a, in a process of movement, <coughs> from our communication with ourselves and others through narrative and vernacular media to mass representations of the past which we might not have directly experienced. So it's, it's both about first-hand experience and about second, third, fourth, fifth-hand experience as well. So we've seen concepts emerge like cosmopolitan memory, uh, work by Daniel Levy, transcultural, which I've already mentioned, multidirectional memory. They've all been developed to explain the ways in which memories that are embedded <coughs> in cultural forms um, and move over which move over time, and in doing so, how those particular cultural forms shape and support contemporary social and personal identities. So, for example, in relation to transcultural memory and multidirectional memory, the socio-political upheavals of late modernity, mass migration, genocide, economic and cultural globalisation, mean that memory moves in new ways and on unprecedented scales. <coughs> So in studies of global memory, there's been a particular focus on macro-political dynamics um, involved in spatial movements, so the role of states, institutions, elites, and public bodies. And this is very, very important, which shouldn't be overlooked. Um, Tomsky suggests that memory doesn't move of its own volition. The movement of memories is enabled by infrastructures of power and is cons consequently mediated and consecrated through institutions. So we need to recognise that this is not this is not a neutral form of movement. This is you know um, this is bound up with the, its own politics. So this understanding the macro politics of mobile memory is essential to, for example, um, how memories of war, genocide, systematic exclusion are able to gain or lose their purchase in the present uh, in social and political discourses. Um, the right to return, the right to recompense, the right to civic inclusion. We talked about um, reconciliation <laughs> very sensibly this morning as, a, as an example. But all, these all hinge on these dynamics. Um, and I know this is something that's, that's, that's really important in relation to the Chrome project. Um, I think when we, when we start to think about mobility just in these macro terms, there are, there are a number of risks I just want to try and pull out. I think the focus, um, the, the focus on the, the cultural movement of memory has a risk of extract, uh, abstracting memory as cultural products from the creative social practices in which they're embedded and which feed into or partly comprise remembering as a process. The very definition of cultural memory revolves around actually an unmooring of memory for, from its originating context, so it's free to travel across space and time. But these aren't fixed units of temporal meaning we're talking about here. Um, they're actively produced and reproduced in and through uh, transitional processes. And in the oscillations between individual remembering practices, social conditions in which they're enacted, and in the cultural and communicative forms in which they're transmitted. So we're talking about processes of disembedding and re-embedding. Um, and that actually we need, to, we need to hold both of those in mind. The other risk is we can sort of render an attachment to locality, slightly ana anachronistic, in the face of global cultural flows. From all of the conversations that we've had this morning, especially the, work that, the conversation with, with, with Paco last night, um, it's, it's, it's patently obvious that embedded re embeddedness remains complexly crucial to the production of the white meaning. We need to understand locality and embeddedness, and actually some forms of immobility as well. So it's about holding in mind that dynamic, I think. And there's also the risk of overlooking everyday processes and practices which comprise acts of remembering. There's been a tendency to focus on the cultural production of memory and its movement, and then how this is received uh, locally, rather than the active embedded production of um, spatially dislocated or transitional memory. Um, so I think that it needs to think a little bit further about that relationship between the cultural production of memory and, and the lived practices of performing it. So what that I've done with Mike Pickering, we've, we've tried to kind of grapple with some of these challenges and some of these problems. And, and to redress what we've seen is a, 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 the risk of underestimating the complexity of the relationships between vernacular processes and remembering 
and space and place. And one element of this has looked at the ways in which spatially dislocated or mobile memories have been made our own, how we incorporate them and understand them as part of our autobiographical um, accounts, utilising and drawing on cultural resources in the process. <clears throat> so we've been concerned with how we make sense of cultural resources, but also with the distinct patterns of symbolic, um, the circulation of symbolic resources that we see um, and a tandem working of public and personal representations that get drawn on in tandem, both in complementary ways and in tension, in new places and times. So, for example, in the most recent um, work, we've seen, you know, diasporic communities in the UK, South Asian communities, making sense of partitions through watching Gurinda Charges, The Viceroy's House, the kind of the, the big British film about partition, um, by watching Bollywood film. BBC coverage, but also their own personal photographs, their own home, their own um, kind of autobiographical stories, those have been inherited, but also food, dress, all of these other vehicles. And that these aren't separate, these are drawn on together. And in a sense, kind of isn't unexpected, it sits in line with other research on the circulation of cultural memory in textual forms, such as work by Alice in Landsberg or um, Prosthetic memory, Yosin Van Dyke's work on personal cultural memory. But the relationship between memory and mobility involves more than a cultural economy of mobile representations of the past, whether these are self produced or, or mass produced. <clears throat> Mnemonic mobility isn't just performed through mobile media texts, um, so in the case of South Asia, between South Asia and the UK. Um, Remembering is a primary process for managing and constituting the meaning of spatial change and mobility. It's a process of coming to terms with the various kinds of social and spatial change we experience over time. And in our earlier project fieldwork, we identified a variety of ways in which remembering was used as a mode of managing experience of spatial mobility and rendering them meaningful over time. So trying to, again, grasp together that, that, that sense of change in space over time. <coughs> um, there's just three I, I, I want to mention here. The first was that we found our sense of belonging in and to a place, as well as our sense of belonging to and with particular people, can be disrupted by changes in place and space. Completely and utterly obvious, you might think. Um, and as Susanna Radstone has suggested, the actuality of our present location can jar actually really quite harshly with the places where we feel we are and where we long to be, producing feelings of being out of that sense of not belonging is really important and it's a not belonging with people, it's a not belonging in, in place. And it's these changes that put demands on memory. We have to continually manage these transitions through everyday practices of remembering in order to establish and then re-establish a coherent and continuous sense of ourselves in relation to others. So making sense of where we do and do not belong turns on the possibility of reconciling what is lost from a past place and what's gained in new places which we inhabit. So actually, it is the task of memory to try and make sense of changes over, over space in time. And then we have a range of raw materials that are um, available to us in order to undertake these tasks. So media texts and technologies operate as these raw materials for mnemonic operations. We've got photographs of former homes which adorn our domestic spaces, for example, creating imagined continuities between there then and here now. And we revisit the places of the past imaginatively, oscillating between them and using past places made available to us in cultural forms. And there was a lovely example from a recent project where Anila, a woman, um, South Asian woman who grew up in Kenya, and I had a, I had a picture of her home in Kenya and she kept this in sort of pride of place in her home in the UK and her daughter then went to Kenya to kind of revisit this particular place and actually the, the ways in which that, that image became kind of a touchstone for understanding um, her daughter's kind of second-hand experience of that migration, um, her own vicarious experience of return through it, her ambivalence in terms of the changes that had occurred there, um, her sense of disconnection, disconnection from her from her current home because of the, of the feelings of loss and lack in the present, all kind of complexly articulated together and the photograph became the entrance to that. <coughs> 
But even further than this, as mobile texts themselves, they make us imaginatively mobile, allowing us to situate our own here nows in relation to the there thens of others. And that was in that particular example, it also became indicative of her daughter's sense of belonging in the UK and not having a connection to Kenya, and that was really important for her. So in this sense, media text afford us a deeply social form of mobile memory. And then we have the last, the last sort of um, category, which is the spatial management of social change over time. So on the other hand, it's not just memory that allows us to negotiate changes in space. Space allows us to, um, it provides us, spatial continuities can provide spatial reference, stable reference points for negotiating other kinds of mobility, temporal or social. So returning to a shared place of belonging after a significant other has died provides a bounded experiential architecture for remembering shared past in the context of a particular, uh, of their present absence. So there's a really nice account that, um, that we took from a novel um, where um, a, a man returned to the site where he used to go walking with his father after his father had died and what the continuities in place allowed him to explore in terms of the, the experience of mourning. So the meanings of place, home, holiday destinations, our secret place, places of danger, can be mobilised in the interest of constructing and articulating a coherent story of an individual life or the collective lived experience of families, groups and communities. And we also identified a variety of stable constellations of places which can provide an architecture for making sense of other kinds of mobility. Um, one of our respondents, sort of, um, she, she was a white British woman, she married a South Asian guy, um, they lived in the same locality as his parents but she was never allowed over the threshold of the door of his parents' house. And it was only actually after they divorced and separated and that she continued to move around this local space and was suddenly invited <coughs> into this home. But the stable architecture of the home allowed her to kind of navigate her changing social relationship. Um, to her extended family, um, which she remained connected to because of their, their, their shared children. <coughs> and so the meanings of this domestic space allowed to, her to tell a coherent story over time about her social mobility and shifting pat patterns of belonging over time. So all I wanted to kind of get to grips with was to give you an illustration that moving in space, time and across social um, social scales uh, all occur together but we need to hold them all in view of each other I think in order for them to make sense so mobility itself is not simply spatial there are these three vectors that we need to hold hold together and those are obviously time space and social all the relational if you think about them and those are intertwined interacting and the challenge is to understand their mutual and synergistic operation in processes of remembering so in this sense, memory is not only mobile because remember is a mobile, um, but in the sense that it's always being performed and re-articulated on the fly through time as a mode of coming to terms with and making sense of and communicating various kinds of mobility that we experience in everyday life. But as examples that we show, um, that we drew from our field work, there's also a politics of remembering in play here um, in these movements, in these vectors, um, across these social scales. So how do we deal with this conceptually? We need a way of reconciling the movement of memory over time and space and between social scales and a methodological approach that reflects this. Um, and one that can account for unevenness and power differentials in this kind of synergistic operation. Um, and that was, that was the challenge that I was sort of facing. So this is where trajectory comes in. How much of time? Okay, so mnemonic trajectories. <coughs> so in this sense, our understandings um, and mobilisations of the past are always emergent. They're always um, in relation to a continually moving, experiencing subject. And analysing this movement, incorporating three vectors, requires this grasping of a sense of trajectory in the process of remembering, which is produced through... So it's, it's an active production at the, at the in, in the interstitial space between movement in time, space, and across social scales. And it always involves uh, a variety of interpenetrating media and modalities of communication. 
So by attending to trajectories, we can explore the interpenetration of time and space in the processes of remembering in, a med in media, media saturated cultures without fixing the social, temporal, or spatial dimensions of any given ecology of memory. So it's about being able to grasp them all as constantly moving. So I did some work with Anna Redding a little while back, quite a while back now, um, on mobility itself, kind of slightly disconnected from the issue of memory, but I've been trying to sort of find ways of bringing it together. And we, we started talking about trajectory. We, we liked it because it implies attending to both cause and process um, in order to think about mobility. Because one of the things about mobility is we can often work with a very neutral sense of mobility. And actually, trajectory implies where we've come from, where we're going to, why we're moving. Uh, and, and that's really quite important. So it's not simply about free movement, but we need to account for intentionality and unevenness in communicative relationships. And there's, there's been some wonderful work that I, I hadn't really kind of um, come across um, up until relatively recently. Sarah Sharma's work on pornographies. <coughs> Um, it has been really interesting. She draws on the work of Doreen Massey on power geometry. Um, and she, she kind of elaborates this idea of power chronography, that there are temporal, there, are, there is a politics to time that we, we always need to sort of think about. So she recognises that time sensibilities are always political, produced at the intersections of social differences and in institutions. So by attending to trajectory, or rather trajectories, this is not a singular thing, as the neuronic synthesis of movement in time and space, we can account for both the chronographic and the geometric elements of the production of mediated temporal experience and its political dimensions. So this all seems really quite abstract, so I'm going to try and work through an example um, to kind of show you what I mean. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to take a case study um, from... Um, Actually, I'm not. I'm going to tell you a little bit more of that before I, before I go on to the case study. I'm going to tell you a little bit about post-colonial memory and the, and the MOP project, and then I'll, then I'll go through the example. Um, so I'm, not going to, I'm, I'm going to whiz through this bit because I think the, the example is much more interesting. Um, okay. So the MMPI project, which is migrant memory and the post-colonial imagination, for anyone that's interested. Um, I, it's found this, I found this concept of mnemonic trajectories really, really useful in understanding the transitions in time and space specific to post-colonial migrations between India and the UK and their mnemonic legacies. So the project itself examines processes and practices of remembering the 1947 partition of India in South Asian di diasporic communities in the UK and their contemporary significance in the production of interscalar communities, ethnic, religious, familial, across and between local, national, and intercon intercontinental sites and imaginaries. So the project retains a concern for the vernacular and the local, but in its attention to mobility, it seeks to connect these practices with large-scale historical mobilities as well. And partition as an event, of migration as a process, and of diasporic experience is always shot through the residue of mobility as the milieu in which these um, memories are performed. So we're, we're still quite at the beginning of this project, um, but, but the ambition is to explore this in more detail. <coughs> so applying the insight, insights from the work on everyday remembering and the management of change has resulted in the formulation of a number of specific concerns about the memory of mobilities precipitated by partition and the mobility of partition memory in the MMPI project. So the first concern we've got is how is mobility remembered? We're concerned with the remembering of movement between places, how are complex migratory experiences, so people's movements across partitions, um, original borders, um, so, so partition occurred in um, the east and the west in Punjab and Bengal, but also um, it precipitated movement between South Asia and the UK, and also other, you know, related to other mobilities as well. So South Asians who come through East Africa and other British colonies. And we want to know how these are remembered in the interest of performing social action in the present, constructing personal life narratives, situating oneself in relation to others, considering how post-colonial relations are negotiated in these memories specifically. In contrast between um, direct migration and Far East Africa, there's a, there's a big difference in terms of class, region, bureaucratic histories in relation to empire, for example. So, trying to understand those. 
Uh, we were interested in how these experiences of radical spatial dis dislocations precipitated, not just by partition, but by the end of empire, and managed through, re uh, through remembering practices. Gender and sexual violence is very important. It was incredibly significant as part of partition, and the body as a site of memory, and I know this is something that's, that's important in terms of the, the Chrome project as well, um, you know, linked to issues around performance, metaphor, and the descent into the other day that Vina Das has talked so extensively about. So we're thinking about how partitions mobilised in personal and social memory narratives in order to negotiate and produce communities and social identities over time. We're also interested in inherited mobilities and the intergenerational dimensions of partition memory. How is it communicated in and over generations? How are people caught between times and spaces of radical difference? And how does this shape their view of their own identity as mobile or between places? And then, of course, there's how is remembering itself mobile, not just how is mobility remembered? Uh, we need to think about how mobile the amount of resources are used, how mobile cultural texts pertain to partition, everything from Bollywood film to personal photographs, operators resources for remembering and making sense of partition, um, both personally and socially, um, over time occur. So we're just doing some work on colonial nostalgia, for example, looking at uh, the BBC coverage of partition um, last year, and also Gurinda Chada's <coughs> film, The Viceroy's House, which is really important because it was presented as a Brit the, the British Asian take on partition, whatever that means. Um, and, you know, it's absolutely kind of laden with colonial nostalgia. And it's very interesting to see how communities from different, in, in different contexts in the UK relate to that. Bengali communities, um, Punjabi communities, but also people from elsewhere and Gujarat, people who come from East Africa. And then of course then there's particular personal media that have found real salience in terms of the historical trajectories of partition. People didn't carry very much, but things have been sent over, um, and, and inheritances, material inheritances have been really significant. And of course there's that sense of unfinished transition, that people continue to have relationships with South Asia, they continue to move between <coughs> South Asia and the UK routinely and regularly, um, and there are social networks in play that span those two places. So memory is never f in one place or the other, it's always produced in between. So this idea is, of trajectory is very really important. Um, and diasporic experience shows, throws into sharp relief the com complex spatial and temporal trajectories that can be in play in processes of remembering. And um, Esther Pingu has talked about diasporic identities having this particular challenge because they're predicated on removal not just from a particular location in space and a moment in time, but also from particular social practices of space time through which a community conceptualises its surroundings in its own case within them. So if she, she, in a very complex way, she says, diaspora then emerges as a particular form of doubled chronotopical interpolation as a dwelling in dyschronotopicality. So it's out of place, out of time. I, I think I would summarise that. So in this way, diasporic experience is shot through the movements between their thens and here nows. And it's characterised by an especially complex set of relations to being in time and space. Okay, so now, now is the more interesting example. This is really dense. I'm going to read it out because I think it's a really nice example, but I wanted it to be written um, somewhere. Um, so this is, this is uh, from an interview with a young woman, a uh, young um, she was um, actually born in India, but has lived her entire life in, in the UK. She was in her early 30s at the time, uh, living at home with her parents in a Midland city in the UK. Her parents are first, genera first generation migrants uh, from, to the UK from India. Um, and she identifies as a second generation migrant, that's how she describes herself. And she kind of discusses at length in this interview, it's from a very, very long interview, um, about her struggles with transitioning between India and the UK, but also between her parents' generation and her own, um, and her kind of cross-generation interactions. And it kind of really closely reflects this kind of sense of being out of space and out of time that Karim has talked about. Um, and she, at the time, she was also she was exploring her own identity as a, as a photographer. Okay. So she says, um, oh, I've got a bit extra here. 
well. Uh, the reason I got into photography is because there are lots of questions about who I am, where I'm going. This is not on here actually, it's just an extra few sentences. Um, there are things with the way my life is and the cultural con conflict between myself and my parents. I realised there was a real gap in communication between my generation, which is second generation Indian, and with my parents' generation, which is first generation Indian. Um, and in the first instance, she describes photographs, um, she, she, she kind of goes through taking photographs of her sort of um, her own uh, family out of this box and she kind of narrates them as she's going. And she describes the photographs of her family from her early childhood in, in detail and explores this kind of multifaceted generational rupture between herself and her parents. So she's like, I want to build up this historical story for my children. I want to kind of alleviate that emotional baggage that I've always had through not being able to figure things out. It's basically to do with the cultural divide and the expectations that are placed on me, particularly because I still live at home. There's an enormous sense of guilt there because my parents have given up so much to be here, especially when you look at old pictures and you think, God, I'd be bloody miserable. They gave up a lot to come to England in search of a better life. My dad's going to be 70 this year, and my mum, she's 11 years off retirement and she's ready to retire. She's absolutely exhausted, but they just carry on working. There's this enormous sense of guilt because you feel you have to give them as much as they've given you. I have this obligation to stay at home because my sister's moved away. My parents will say, we'd like to go back to India, but we can't until you're married. That's a big one. There's this moral obligation to do the right thing. It's not like they've just given up a few years of holidays for us. They gave up years and years. For the first 15 or 20 years of them being married, they never went to India. They couldn't even phone home for a long time. And then there's also this anger there as well because of the dark period, the period where I was really trying to find my own voice as a young woman. Prior to that and during it, it was kind of violent. It was just an awful time where I think the experiences that my parents had were disciplining children, disciplining a child was through beating and stuff like that, and it was really bad at one point. There was a real anger around that. And the fact that they didn't understand what we were going through in a Western environment, they expected the same things from us as they went through. They just accepted that they weren't going to go out. They weren't going to have boys who were friends. I suppose I was good, but now I just got to a point where I thought, sod it, I'm just going to go out and do it anyway. For them, it was more that they, than they could deal with. So thinking about Kia's retrospective um, and prospective mnemonic act of viewing her childhood photographs, it's possible to identify a range of spaces and times that are in play. And they include the times of the life course, the vectors of ageing, work time, representational time of the photograph, communicative time of the telephone, and in later extracts she talks about TV consumption, that's really important. Generational time, childhood, adolescence, historical time, and alongside these different forms of time, um, there are key spatial reference points. England, India, the West domestic spaces, shared public spaces, implied workspaces. However, it's, it's when we consider the mediated time of the photograph that we begin to see the ways in which these space times are synthesised into directional <coughs> mnemonic trajectories. Yeah, they're going somewhere. In her initial talk around a particular photograph of her parents' home in the 1970s, she describes a somewhat undesirable image of her parents' domestic life on their arrival in the UK. Temporal features of the photograph arrest a moment in time for an experiential flow and allow it to be brought into the present, objectified and disconnected from its original occurrence. So he is then able to resituate this moment in relation to her own contemporary experience, expectations and subject positions. She describes her parents' home in the 1970s as bloody miserable. Um, and she details, you know, elsewhere, she talks about old curtains, mismatched furniture, wood chip wallpaper, recycled plastic containers. Um, the traces of which she notes are very much in evidence in their house today. So the time of the photographic image is not the only media temporality in play, her parents' basic standard of living and the suffering that it represents to here. It's firmly located um, in the UK with a telephone, you know, and links to the ter telephone or the absence of the telephone and the inability to make spatial temporal connections to home. Um, because the telephone has a potential to provide these spatial temporal proximities and immediacies for markings which are belonging and, and cultural connection. So their experience of making do, going without exhausting blue collar work, is at odds with her own expectations <clears throat> for life of her, for herself in the West and the moral undertaking of seeking a better life is one that she will not have to endure because of their sacrifice. 
So she locates her parents in an anticipated future in India, permitted only once she has enabled them to go by fulfilling her own obligation to marry. So the fixed space time of the 1970s image and the past and present hardships that it represents provide a starting point for this kind of creative narrative trajectory for her parents that we might characterise as even a return to a former home. <coughs> so this account implies a particular kind of power, chrono uh, uh, power chronography in the sense that Kia's mnemonic account is shot through with post-colonial politics. The intersectional experiences of deprivations of working class life, the temporal and spatial dislocations of my greater experience after empire become the chronographic and topographic lens through which her own autobiographical experience is rendered meaningful, drenched with competing senses of aspiration, duty, obligation and revulsion. So the power chronographies that are being articulated in and through the performance <coughs> of the numbering actively construct post-colonial experiential trajectories. So, in conclusion, I think we need to grasp together time, space and the social in terms of the way they're all moving at the same time. Um, and I think trajectory is one way to do that. It's one way of doing it which, which, which holds in mind the fact that these are uneven processes of mobility. All of them, they actually produce specific political conditions. Um, so we need to have this sense of intentionality, inequality and unevenness, not only in the processes of moving through space, but thinking about how these are actively reproduced and negotiated through practices of remembering. And this is a challenge and an opportunity when it comes to understanding memory in a post-colonial context, where the politics of the movement are intimately connected to the politics of memory. And I think the point I finish on is a bit of a call to action, that we can only understand these, these trajectories if we're going to do or incorporate sustained ethnographic field work into what we're doing. Because, and I think this is really important, is because these trajectories kind of sort of filter down into the, into the everyday. It's, it's, Bina Das has talked about this idea of the descent into the ordinary. And I think this is so important. And to unpick the ways in which these trajectories, these demonic trajectories, are, are embedded, I think, in everyday experience is really, really important. And only then can we connect them up to those macro politics. Um, and we need to see these uh, in a continuum. We need always to hold in, 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 in mind the relationship between political, you know, the, 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 the cultural and political and institutional levels of mobility in relation to vernacular practice. Thank you. Thank you.